All right, if I could have you guys come back. We will take our Bibles. Uh, they're going to hand out, uh, everybody gets one of those. Romans chapter 9. We're going to go over three chapters tonight. Romans 9, 10, and 11. And everybody gets one of those. So we're not going to read all three chapters uh, tonight, but we will uh, read a few verses at the beginning of the, uh, or, you know, at the beginning of, as we go through the chapter, before we do. There's the first one. That took a while. I, I, I felt left out, so I brought my notebook tonight, even though they're already in there. I just wanted to be a part of the gang. So do you have one for yourself? All right. I love it, I love it, I love it. All right, so Romans chapter 9, <clears throat> let's, uh, we'll start with the notes and then we'll, and then we'll uh, delve into each chapter um, a little bit. Uh, Romans chapter 9, it is important to know that Romans 9, 10, and 11 are focused primarily on God's people, Israel. In these chapters, God explains his turning from Israel to the Gentiles because, uh, because Israel rejected their Messiah. And so uh, he explains the manner in which the elect people, Israel, failed to seek him by faith and were consequently set aside. Then he sets forth the subsequent rejection of the gospel by the Gentiles and is turning again in the latter days to his fulfillment of the covenant with Israel as a nation. Uh, don't do it. Don't chase the squirrel. We're going to get there. Just, let, just stay focused. Okay, all right, we'll do it. Um, the Apostle Paul exhorted young Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, uh, there's, if you study Bible study, there are some principles you need to keep in mind when you're studying your Bible. And, and to do those things, to, to keep those principles in mind, is to rightly divide the word of truth. All right? In other words, there, there are principles. The, the entire word of God is for us. Okay, it's profitable. Yep. It's profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. But not everything written in that book was written to us, specifically to us. We can't take a promise that only applies to the nation of Israel and apply it to us. Right. Now, there's principles, okay, um, uh, the one that comes to my mind is um, Isaiah, I think it's 42, uh, where God, uh, he's speaking to the nation of Israel, where he says, uh, I will work and who will let it. But if you look in the beginning part of that chapter, he's specifically talking about gathering Israel together. And, and even though, yes, he is specifically talking about gathering Israel together, but one day there's going to be a trumpet where God is going to gather his people, the church, together. So there's still principles, okay? Um, and uh, my mind goes back to the message Brother Barnes preached uh, here a few months ago on a Thursday night on hyper-dispensationalism. What happens is you got a lot of these guys that they, they will hold to that rightly dividing the word of truth, 
and, and they carry it to where that's what they end up being, hyper-dispensationalism, which means this much of the Bible is for us today. All right, and, and so I'd encourage you, go back, and even if you have, go back and watch that message uh, from Brother Barnes uh, back in, I believe it was October, um, he preached that. And so, uh, so that's one principle, is that, you know, we have to rightly divide. And so these chapters uh, are, are, uh, would, would, would apply uh, to be thought of, uh, to be kept in mind during that. All God's word is for us. It is profitable, but context is important. I saw a meme that was going around social media about, it was a Valentine's Day card from Joel Osteen. And, uh, and, it, and, and it was Joel Osteen looking at, I don't know if it said, any, it might have been the Bible or something. And it, again, Valentine's Day card, it says, you must be context because I'm taking you out. Get it, Valentine's Day, taking you out, out on a date. But he just takes it out, like removes, con anyways. <clears throat> I thought it was funny when I saw it. Um, does that mean, uh, even though it's primarily dealing with nations, not individuals, does that mean that we don't pay attention or not read these chapters? Absolutely not. And does it mean that there is nothing in these chapters for us? Again, no way. But it does mean that there are things in these chapters that deal with Israel primarily and Israel only. A clear understanding of these chapters will quickly discount the false teachings of replacement theology. It blows my mind today the amount of Baptists that believe in replacement theology. You say, what is that? They believe that, that God set aside, in Romans there and in Acts, when God set aside the, the, the Jew and went to the Gentile, that he did that permanently, and that the church has replaced Israel as God's chosen people. People. That's heresy. Uh, that is a total flat out discounting of the word of God. Uh, I mean, when he talks about the remnant and gathering them again, which he does in the New Testament in Romans 9, 10 and 11. How can you? I don't even know where you get that. Like, how can you even come up with that? Um, another heresy that can be t discounted as a result of these chapters is Calvinism. A careful study of the word elect will reveal that most of the time when this word is used in the Bible, God is referring to the nation of Israel, not all of the saved. Does he refer to the saved people as elect in other parts of the Bible? Yes. Okay? Yes, he does. But, but primarily that meaning, and the word doesn't appear a whole lot of times, but primarily that word, that meaning of elect is talking about the nation of Israel. And so, uh, again, it's not going to be an in-depth like we did one chapter on, we spent three weeks on chapter six, and then, you know, chapter seven by itself, chapter eight by itself. This, we're just going to hit some highlights here out of these three chapters. But I didn't want to break them up because they're, they're again, specifically for, uh, you, you know, have a lot to do with Jewish history and Jewish prophecy, so in chapter 9, look in verse number 1. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, uh, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. And verse 4, who are Israelites? Yeah. Don't forget, Paul was a Jew. Okay, so he's talking about his people. And, um, and uh, we see how serious he was about them coming to Christ when he said, if it was possible, I wish the Lord would just, he's saying here, just let me go to hell if it means Israel getting saved. Yeah. That's what he's saying there, okay? Uh, that's a pretty serious burden. Moses prayed that. Yeah. You know, the only place in the, Bi in the King James Bible uh, where you see that dash where he says, if not, blot me out of thy book. And, um, and so, uh, so we have Paul's burden for the Jews. Then in verses 4 through 14, 
We have a history lesson on the origin of God's people, the Jews. We see the term Israelite. An Israelite is a term that applies to both a Hebrew and a Jew. If you go over to Genesis, or Genesis, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 34, it's not going to be there. <laughs> Jeremiah 34. Yes, it is. Uh, we see the two terms in there, okay? That every man, verse 9, that every man should let his manservant and every man his maidservant, being an Hebrew or an Hebrewist, go free that none should serve himself of them, to wit, of a Jew his brother. So those are two terms. Now, uh, today, um, on a... On a bigger scale, uh, a Jew is almost said as a slang term. Uh, it's, it, it's meant as a derogatory term. Not in the Bible. I'm just saying culturally today, um, it's meant that way. Uh, now, here, here's again, you have to understand this also back over in Romans chapter 9. Not every physical Jew is a spiritual child of God. The Jew, just like the Gentile, must be saved by grace to be a spiritual child of God. Jews still have to get saved. Okay? Um, and then I, I, I know I'm not the brightest bulb in the, in the pack. And, and probably everybody in here has seen this before. But it, it hit me this week like... And then when I thought, man, what a great revelation. And then I said, really? That's the first time you thought of that? It's embarrassing for me that it's the first time that I thought about that. About uh, when God promised Sarah that she would have a child at 90 years old. God's chosen people came out of an unnatural birth. It was a supernatural birth. That's how we become children of God. You say, I saw that when I was two years old. Praise God. It takes me a while, okay? Um, and then uh, God's plan was for Jacob's line to be blessed, all right? Esau have I hated, Jacob have I loved. Uh, and then in verse uh, number 14, Romans chapter 9, verse number 14, what shall we say then is their unrighteousness with God, God forbid? Meaning, Somebody looks at that verse and says, well, God said I've hated Esau, but I've loved Jacob. I mean, th that ain't right. God, how could God do that? Because God can do whatever he wants to, and whatever he does is right. Why did he even pick Abraham? Why, did, why didn't he pick somebody else? Because he could do whatever he wants, okay? So... And then we have really uh, the, the next division of this chapter uh, goes from verses 15 down to the end of the chapter. You probably could divide it up even further, but we're just being general here. Uh, the election of the nation of Israel. Now, you have to remember in verses 15 through 19, when he's talking about Moses and having mercy on whom he will have mercy and all that kind of stuff, um, He's talking about individual, he's, he's not talking about individual salvation, he's talking about the election of Israel. Not, there's a difference, national versus individual. Uh, another principle of Bible study applies here is the law of first mention, which states... Now, again, this is generally, okay, these are, God does not mention in his Bible the law of first mention. These are principles of, of scholars and preachers and people that down through the years that have studied the Bible and looked at the word of God, and they have kind of developed these things uh, just to be a help. And, and so the law of first mention states that as a general rule, 
The first time a word appears in the Bible, that it is generally the, generally the context in which it will be used throughout the Bible. There's exceptions to every rule, and there's rules for every exception. Okay? So, let's look at this word elect. Go to Isaiah 42. That chapter that I was referencing a couple of minutes ago, actually, Isaiah 42... So the very first time the word elect is found in the Bible is in Isaiah chapter 42, verse number 1. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Now you read the rest of that chapter. He's talking about the nation of Israel. Okay? And so... Uh, so Isaiah 42 1 when he's talking about elect was for Israel to carry out God's will of judgment to the Gentiles the service of the child of God is to carry out God's will for that person's life again there's a principle that can be applied or has a multiple applications but, but get, the, get the context get the uh, intent okay um, and then in Romans chapter 9, verses 20 through 23, um, uh, it was the will of God to choose Israel to be his people. They were, and it talks about that clay, the lump of clay God would do with it whatever he willed to do with. Um, and, uh, and then in verses 30 to 33, it uh, talks about how and why the gospel went to the Gentiles after the Jews, and that was because they rejected it, and, and we can't change that. Now go to chapter 10. Chapter 10, Romans chapter 10. Again, we have here um, another part of, of um, Paul's desire Look what he says there, Romans chapter 10, verse number 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now, again, everyone that believeth, is he talking about Jews or Gentiles? Yes, right. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Again, the, these, two, these first couple of verses talk about could dispel replacement theology. If God permanently gave up the Jews, why would Paul beg God that they should be saved? There would be no need for that. Um, verse number seven, uh, uh, let's read verse seven. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. The context of the whole chapter is the national blindness of Israel and the reception of the truth by the Gentiles and Gentile nations. The Jews rejected their Messiah and the manuscripts of the prophets of Israel. Very few Jews will discount or will, will accept anything from uh, after the first five books of the Bible. Joshua, Judges, Isaiah, Jeremiah... It, 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 all they hold to, I believe, Orthodox Jews, all they hold to is the, is the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy. And, um, and they rejected all of that. Okay, so therefore, God sent a salvation unto the Gentiles. Acts chapter 28. And there's other references before this one, but Acts chapter 28, uh, verse number 28. Be it known, therefore, unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. Um, he, he mentions 
uh, the gospel going from the Jews to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 18. And so, um, and, and so uh, God gave them space. He gave them 4,000 years. And when the Messiah was come, they rejected him. He came unto his own and his own uh, received him not. Uh, Romans chapter 10, look in verse number 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth uh, confession is made unto salvation. Uh, can I just say to you what this says in our notes? God is under no obligation to persuade men who want to be willfully ignorant. You say, what are you talking about? This is what I'm talking about. Any second presentation of the gospel that the Lord would give an individual is strictly the grace and mercy of God. Now, there, I'm not saying there aren't any in here, because there might be. How many in here, you got saved the very, very first time you heard the gospel? You know what, you know what we're all looking at here? Miracles of mercy and grace. Amen. Um, and there will come a day when his grace and mercy to man will be completely withdrawn. Revelation chapter 22, uh, verse number 11. Revelation chapter 22, verse number 11. Now, this is at the end, okay? He's getting ready to extend an invitation one more time. But he says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Now, have you ever heard this expression? Maybe you've used this expression. You have said, um, such and such... If the Lord tarries his coming, God is not tarrying his, his coming. He knows when he's coming. All right. He's not, um, maybe today. And then throughout the course of the day say, no, 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 not today. Tomorrow, next week, next month. No, no, no. He already, know, he knows when the cutoff point is. And it's known only to him. Jesus said he didn't even know. Well, how is that? Now, there's another thought. How is that possible? Jesus is God. God knows everything. All right? He's also, the son is also subject to the will of his father. And the father has willed that his son, who is God, is not going to know that. Okay? Bang your head up against a brick wall. You'll feel better. Amen? Amen? Uh, but, but there's coming a point where he's going to be done. And who knows when that, nobody knows when that's going to be. Um, I remember back in the eighties, all the date setters, you know, 88 reasons why he's coming in 88, 1988. And, uh, and then that book was a flop. And then they had to do a redo, 89 reasons. And they did a redo, 89 reasons why he's coming in 89. Guess what number one reason was? He didn't come in 88. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, um, and, and what's even crazier today is, is I, I've got some good preacher brethren that are date setters. Um, you know, I, be ready. He's coming in an hour that you think not, Okay. It could be today, it could be 500 years from now, right? So who knows? But there is coming a day when he's going to say, he that's unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is uh, holy, let him be holy still. Okay, so chapter 11, Romans chapter number 11. Okay, so we have this group that says... Uh, that God has set aside his people, Israel. Let's look at verse number one in chapter 11. 
I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. Oops. Uh, I, they didn't get that memo. Amen. Well, it's probably because they didn't write, you know, they were, they dispensationalized that part right out. Uh, but, uh, you know, he, no, there's no, he has not. Did he not say that he was going to establish his seed for ever? I mean, we got all these things that God says, but, you know, theologians know more than God knows. They, they're convinced of that. Knowledge puffeth up. Knowledge puffeth up. Um, so, uh, so we see here in uh, verses 13 through 25, the blindness of Israel and the branches uh, that were grafted in. Um, and there's mul- and he uses the... He's consistent. He's consistent. You look in, Dan, is it Daniel? Um, you look in other parts of the Old Testament, God made reference to vines and branches in the Old Testament. And that he's continuing that in the New Testament. Um, uh, verse number 21 For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. One day, Jew and Gentile alike, lost Jew and Gentile alike, will be subject to the wrath of God. It will be... Thank God for Romans chapter uh, 8. No condemnation to them that are in Christ. You say, Does the, doesn't the wrath of God worry you? Nope. I'm not, I'm not going to... I am not going to suffer the eternal wrath of God. I'm not all that excited about current judgment. Okay. Um, I, I, I get so excited when I think about uh, when, you, when you think about the direction the put the, the, the um, uh, momentum that President Trump has going into this election. It's exciting to see. He, he, is, he is no, no, I read an article that said no candidate in modern history has won the first three primaries, all three of them. And he's, he is setting records in this year's election that, that have, haven't happened in a long time. That's exciting. Here's a problem, though, and I'd be happy to be wrong. They didn't let him win re-election. What makes them think they're going to let him win this year? One explanation. God is mad at this country. Okay? So politically, in the news, yeah, I'm excited. Go Trump. Yep, that's, I, I'm voting for him. I don't care what anybody thinks or says. Yep, Absolutely. But let's, let's add the spiritual connotation here. I don't think it's going to happen in a million years. Okay? Um, uh, you know, who, if it's going to be the... Uh, him. Or whatever. Live stream. Stay focused. Live stream. Um, and then in verses 26 through 36 of chapter 11, it wraps up with the promise of a deliverer to Israel. Okay, in verse number 26, it's a promise of Israel being regathered, not uh, that they should receive personal salvation. You have to be careful with that, okay? David, in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms, uses the word salvation many times. You have to understand context. Not every time that he uses the word salvation is he talking about being saved. He's talking about they came to kill me, but they didn't, but God didn't let it happen, so I'm thankful for God's salvation. So you have to understand those words. Um, 
And so um, another proof text that election has to do with the nation, not salvation, verse 28, uh, as concerning uh, the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Well, who's beloved? God's chosen people. What's the context? Israel. Okay, so you have to understand that. Um, uh, verse 29, God choosing Israel was a gift and calling for Israel, and he will not repent of that. Now, I thought this was interesting um, in verses 33 through 36. Let's read these verses, and we'll wrap it up and uh, move on to uh, prayer time. Um, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor or who hath first given to him, <coughs> excuse me, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Now, what you have in those verses in that passage is a bunch of verses that you, when you look at context, they, then they can stand alone on their own because those statements are true. But when you look at the context of the chapter of God choosing Israel, why would, why would God choose Israel? Why would God choose Abraham and, and make a, a people uh, uh, out of them and th those be his blessed people? Here's the answer to that question. Verse 34, who would know the mind of the Lord? Who, who knows? Who, who knows? Uh, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. You want to know why God chose Israel and God chose Abraham? Because of his knowledge and wisdom. I mean, he, you can take guesses and they'd be interesting. I mean, not that there would necessarily be any wrong answers unless it was like totally crazy and far-fetched. But, but land-wise... Israel is about as big as Rhode Island. God did not pick some massive country like Turkey or Iran or Iraq. He chose this tiny little, that makes sense. That it would not be a populist decision, right? Based on the wisdom and knowledge of God. And, and so great verses there, 33 through 36. You can use them. You can claim them. Um, uh, man, I don't understand why the Lord led me to do this, or I don't understand why the Lord let this happen to me. Well, who would know the mind of the Lord? It, it can apply to you and me. Yeah. But when you look at the context of choosing Israel and setting them aside only to come back to them, I mean, that's the... Of him, to him, through him, all things. It's up to him. And so that's uh, Romans 9, 10, and 11. And so uh, next week we will, uh, Lord willing, uh, move on. If I could have...